Good evening, everyone. My name is Diani Lewis, and on behalf of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'd like to welcome you to the library's online author event for this evening, which is the Best Australian Science Writing 2020. The Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges the Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma original owners of the lands on which the library services operate. They pay respect to Wadawurrung and East, Eastern Ma elders past, present and emerging and they acknowledge and celebrate the First Nations people of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. But because this is an online event, we're joining from many regions around the place tonight. Uh, I live and work on the land of the Yalakut Willem clan of the Boonwurrung people, and Sarah is also joining us from Boonwurrung country. So I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to Boonwurrung elders, past, present and emerging, and also to the traditional owners and elders from uh, wherever you might be joining us tonight. Now, before we start with the webinar, uh, some brief housekeeping reminders. So. By all means, everyone who is, is, uh, has come along tonight can participate in this webinar by clicking on the Q&A button, which is down the bottom of your screen. Um, that's preferable to clicking on the chat button. Try and uh, yeah, remember to click on the Q&A button and you can um, uh, type in a question and we'll try to pick those up. I'll try to pick those up as we go along. Any that I don't um, see, we'll uh, ask towards the end. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded, so if you'd like to watch this discussion again or recommend it to friends or family, then it'll be uploaded to the, uh, the library's YouTube channel in, in the next couple of days. So I'll introduce myself first. I'm Diani Lewis, and uh, I'm a scientist turned freelance science journalist. I'm based in Melbourne. Um, and since the start of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, I've been reporting on the science that's central to this government's uh, response and the policies that it's, that it's put in place, like keeping us all, <laughs> keeping many of us home tonight. Uh, but I'm also a regular contributor of news and features for uh, the journal Nature, um, the science-based Cosmos magazine, um, and a lot of my work has found homes elsewhere as well in uh, Science, The Guardian, The Monthly, Smith Journal. Um, and fortunately, some of those pieces have also appeared in the Best Australian Science Writing Anthologies. Um, and I, I'm the editor for the 2021 anthology, which is coming out in November. But tonight I'm delighted to have um, Sarah Phillips with us, who is, the editor for, oh dear, this anthology, <laughs> which is back to front, front and fuzzy, the best Australian science writing 2020. Um, <laughs> uh, and this, this event, I should also say, is part of, um, part of National Science Week. So um, it's a fitting anthology to be covering for the event. I'll introduce Sarah. Sarah's a, the, editor of the uh, 2020 anthology. She's executive editor for the Asia Pacific region of Nature Research Group's custom publishing arm. And previously she was the national environment reporter for the ABC, where she filed news and feature stories for online radio and television. And she was the editor of ABC Environment Online, which is an our archived portal of ABC's environment content. Welcome Sarah. G'day. G'day, thanks for having me and thank you to Geelong for uh, the Geelong Regional Libraries for having us both here this evening. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here and we're very disappointed, both of us, that we couldn't come yes. down and do this in person. Absolutely, it would have been, it would have been lovely, but um, we'll make do with Zoom as so, yep. so, so many of our meetings <laughs> are run these days. Um, so Sarah, the Best Australian Science Writing Anthology is has really become a bit of an institution now in Australia. But there are probably lots of people who don't really know how a book like this comes together. Can you sort of, I guess, take us behind the scenes a little bit on, you know, what, what the process looks like, how a book like this comes together? Yeah, sure. So it, the timeline is basically, um, when does the call out happen? End of, end of 
I've got a dog down here. I think it's in November. Decided to start year. barking. Um, yeah, at end of November, there's a call out to all the science writers around Australia. And some of those people know who they are. And so they get themselves ready for the call out. And some of the people don't realise that they're science writers yet. And uh, so the editor of each year's anthology does a bit of trawling. It goes on to likely looking places and tries to find new and exciting writers that haven't been featured in the anthology previous years. And um, the more uh, traditional journalists, science journalists who know about this, get themselves organised and sort through their stories and find the one they like. The deadline is the end of March, I think. And uh, as I recall, by the, you know, March 30, I had, I don't know, 20 stories. By, March, by April 1, I had <laughs> 300 and something <laughs> stories because nobody gets themselves organised until the last minute. And then from there, the process is that the editor makes the selection. So uh, I read through all of those stories, the entire lot of submissions, from um, the, every single one all the way through and made the judgment call of whether or not it constituted cons the best of Australian science writing um, and it's you know it's a an enjoyable process I found um, for me it was sitting up in bed with a cup of tea for an hour every morning for quite some time <laughs> until I'd actually got through all of those stories but because you're reading the best of Australian science writing it's pleasurable like these are fantastic stories that people submit and so uh, the process of going through those stories was actually really enjoyable. Um, once I've got a short list together, then we took it to our science advisory panel. Um, and they are eminent scientists in Australia across a range of fields, um, you know, from, from physics right through to biology. And so we took the short list to them and said, look, you know, what about these? And they then got to read um, especially ones in their field um, and they vetted them for scientific accuracy or uh, whether it really was an interesting new development or whether it was you know that we've heard these stories before and they come to naught that sort of thing mm -hmm. so the the scientific advisory panel then vetted those and and once I had a really good shortlist I then you know took it back to uh, UNSW Press or New South Press and uh, yeah, said so this is the shortlist. And from there we assembled the pieces. So then, then it's an administrative process, which is where New South comes in because they get all the rights for the stories to be republished in this anthology. Right, right. And, and so you're, you're an editor um, in your day job outside of putting together this anthology. And presumably you have more than a passing interest in, in science. So what sort of science reading do you do or were you doing before you had this massive <laughs> dozens and dozens of articles to read through delivered to your inbox? Yeah, I mean, I read really widely and I'm really unselectively. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like Twitter is a really good source of, of news for me. You know, I spend not tons of time on Twitter, to be honest, but for me, my day job, um, I, I kind of sit down at my computer every morning with my cup of tea, always a cup of tea involved for some reason. <laughs> um, and I go, I do a lot of reading just broadly of science stories because it's part of my job to stay on top of these sorts of things. And so, you know, I'll, I'll run through everything. You know, there are some places that you go to regularly that you know there's going to be good stuff, like places like Undark and Aeon and, and you know, Cosmos magazine. Those sorts of things are consistently got good quality stuff. The Atlantic, obviously. Um, just Ed Yong. Everyone wants to be Ed Yong when they grow up. <laughs> um, but then, they, you know, you go to other more unexpected places just via Twitter or someone posts something and you, you discover new new publications. And to be honest, this year, I discovered a new publication um, through Ivy She's work. She published in Haiku, well, no, not Haiku, what's it called? Hakai. Hakai, thank you. It's not Haiku, it's something else that sounded <laughs> Japanese. Um, Hakai magazine, which I hadn't heard of before, and now I go and read them quite regularly. Yeah, yeah, they're a great publication. And uh, yeah. and it's always, it's always exciting to find new publications amid the often gloom in, in, in publishing that there are 
places closing up shop and everything but um yeah, yeah. and that, that's an interesting point too because there is a lot of gloom about the media a lot mm. but I think that one of the things that I was quite surprised about and happy about when I assembled this particular anthology was that Australian science writers were getting their work published in really international journals and publications and um you know really high quality stuff so I, I really felt that even though the Australian media landscape has certainly radically changed in the last 10 years um, that Australian science writers are obviously adapting to the times and still finding outlet for our work and our words. Yeah and tell me a bit about what people I mean the anthology has what 30 odd um, articles from uh, Australian science writers do the topics that people are covering, covering sort of tell you a little bit about what science writers are, you know, what's obsessing them or what's occupying their, their thoughts or what the public wants to hear, I guess, is also part of that, um, would be part of that. What, what, are, what are people focusing on? Yeah, I mean, really, in addition to, I mean, as you would know, Diani, when you're writing a story, there's the process of pitching it to an editor who will take it. And then the editor's got to decide whether or not it's going to appeal to their audience. So there's there's two gates that's got to go through right there. The first gate being, do I think this is interesting? The second gate being, will the, the audience of this particular publication find this interesting? And so having gone through those two gates already, I think you do get an indication of what people are being captured by. And I mean, overwhelmingly, the year that I did it, um, was bush, bushfires <laughs> because if you recall the end of 2019 the beginning of 2020 mm. was just you know the year that Australia caught fire and so I just had a huge number of pieces that were about bushfires and about climate change more broadly and I but looking back at past an anthologies climate change has just been a recurring theme for years now and you know you can go on long and loud about why that might be but um, I think principally because it's not, not a problem that we've solved yet and so it's still exercising uh, scientists mind quite actively as to how we are going to actually get through this okay mm. because I think the reality is that at the moment it's not looking like we will and you know I, I wrote in my introduction I actually talked about um, environmental epiphanies quite a bit because it seemed to be a sort of a theme that a lot of people were having was just this realization that um, you know th that the world is not the world we were born into and that it's radically changed in our lifetime and kind of that sense of loss I think is is quite palpable through a lot of people's writing um, mm. you know I mean science is it traverses a whole range of su subjects obviously but I, I just think for, and for me personally I think climate change is a really important one that we continue to keep coming back to. Yes and certainly um, in the entries that I received that was again like you say a recurring theme and I think um, also the sense that people are you know really starting to starting to despair a little bit of the um, you know the the inaction and so that frustration of of the story is coming through it's it's not just tallying the um the destruction and it's not just proposing new um technologies that might solve things it's really this you know complex human dilemma and i guess that's really um coming through in a lot of people's writing Mm. It'd be interesting to hear though from you Diani because you're putting together the 2021 anthology when I was doing the 2020 anthology because the uh, entries close at the end of March COVID was new and shiny mm -hmm. and I had only a small number of COVID stories but for you presumably it's just been wall-to-wall -wall COVID. You know it's really funny because that's exactly what I expected and we certainly made sure that we had an epidemiologist on our advisory panel this year and uh, it just didn't really turn out to be the case because I think um, and you know as you said science writing can be a whole range of things but um, a lot of the COVID reporting I think was very sort of day-to-day -day newsy um, 
type reporting. And so I didn't, I, I wasn't overwhelmed by, um, uh, by piece, pieces, you know, covering the pandemic. Um, so it did close. Yes, yeah. So I, I did expect that it was going to feature more prominently, but you know, because there's, you know, there's slight overlap in the um, in the years, and so I still had pieces from the beginning of um, 2020 and throughout the middle of 2020 up to beginning of 2021. Bushfires still really, really big topic. Like, yeah, that, right. uh, yeah. I, I think, you know, because. I'm not really sure. I mean, um, I think there's perhaps maybe a broader range of writers that tackle bushfire because there are, you know, nature writers, people who've, you know, really been hit on a personal level. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of bushfire and climate change, and people actually, you know, combining those two. Um, those two narratives as like twin disasters that are these monumental human challenges that we need to solve. Mm. So yeah, yeah, it, um, it's interesting how that one just keeps coming back, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And 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 like you say, not not going away anytime soon. But mm. um, yeah, so I I wanted to ask, you know, we have sort of. <laughs> already dived into a, a lot of um of you know what kind of writing is in um it, are in the books but what are we what are we sort of talking about when we talk about science writing as a as a category like are there are there types of work that um that fit neatly into this this category where, where are the boundaries um for you or for the or for the when you were considering the anthology well, I think part of the process of putting together an anthology is you don't want all of the 30 whatever stories that, that make it in there to be very samey. Um, you know, the, the joy of the best Australian science writing is that it presents a whole series of bite-sized chunks of science, um, different shapes and sizes. It's like a platter of hors d'oeuvres and you can choose which one you like the look of. And so when you're putting together an anthology like that, you're thinking about, you know, well, I've had several long stories here. Maybe I need a shorter one. Or I've had a lot of biology stories. I need a physics one. Or, you know, this one was all fun and silly. I need a very serious investigative piece. Or this one was very literary and this one was very data heavy. So you're trying to present a range of different kinds of stories. And I think that with the best Australian science writing, um, you know, it's it is actually a celebration of that diversity of writing that is out there, um, all covering the topic of science, you know, in, in its broadest sense, but it's still, um, you know, able to be presented in such a range of different ways that it, it shows up um, just exactly how interesting and diverse Australian science writing can be. Yeah, so I was actually really struck by uh, some of the, the poems that, that came in yeah. actually this year because, you know, when I took on this role, I was thinking I, 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 don't, I, I, wouldn't, know, I wouldn't know a good poem from, from a bad one, but, um, but poets are really in there as well, really tackling the, um, the, the tough ethical questions that science faces and um, the breadths of exploration and everything. Um, so yeah, like you say, it's it's not just journalists, it's not just um, scientists, working scientists. It's a whole range of people who are tackling these uh, these topics. Yeah, and as you would expect from poets, really, I mean, you know, it, it is their <laughs> the job of the arts community to reflect society back to itself, so that we can stand in front of the mirror and ponder whether we like what we see. And so, you know, that's that's <laughs> the job of of poets is to present yeah. that information to us. And and you know, that's why I think like me personally I love science writing because it brings together science which is just inherently interesting and it's an intellectual pursuit and writing which is an artistic pursuit and bringing those two things together um, I think it, it creates some new possibilities and new spaces. Yeah so when you're thinking about you know a good piece of science writing I mean it's a very 
subjective kind of thing, isn't it? But when it comes to collating an anthology, you're reading through these dozens and dozens and dozens of, um, of entries. Are there elements um, that really, you know, pop out and make you look twice, read again, or say, you know, okay, this one's a real contender? What, what are some of the elements of, you know, this subjective good science writing? Yeah, well, as you say, it, you know, the best Australian science writing, best according to who? Well, best according to me. <laughs> and, and, and your best Australian science writing, Diani, will be different from mine. And that, that'll be good because it'll be, you know, more than one perspective about what equals best. And, yeah, but for me, I think that is what I was just saying before about that intersection between science and, and um, art is where the, the, the best lies. Um, for me, it's the pieces which give, present to you some science, so some information, factual information, and cloak it in such a way that it is a enjoyable read and gives it, injects it with colour. Um, you know, science is a human activity. It's done by humans and it has all of the flaws that we have and we are deeply flawed creatures. And so I think, therefore, that the, the writing that presents science in that way is the best kind of science writing. And so, you know, writing which, um, you know, it can be as varied as it's just like it's just a ripping yarn. Like uh, there was the one about the Baruli ulcer on the yeah. Mornington Peninsula, and it was just so gross. Like <laughs> <laughs> everyone who read it was like, "Ew, it's disgusting!" <laughs> and and it was great because it's just so much fun to read that. But you know, he was presenting us. The journalist was presenting us with all of this really heavy factual science and and taking us on the journey of the process of discovery and took us back into history back to the 1940s all of this information presented in a way that you just couldn't stop reading because it was just so much fun to read yeah and I think that was that was uh Conrad Marshall's piece yeah yeah um, Jeepers Creepers yes yes that was that was fabulous I think anything that really evokes that strong emotion be it you know, delight or disgust. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, you know, that that's the essence of journalism really is that that's what sells newspapers is, is emotion, is having an emotional response to something. And so I think good science writing is, is exemplified by taking what a lot of people perceive to be as a dry topic, which is, you know, science, and, and then injecting it with that emotion. Uh, it really brings it into a new realm. Yeah. So let's talk about another... Um, Fabulous example from your anthology, the Bragg Prize, uh, which is awarded to the the best uh, piece of the anthology. Uh, last year went to Carol Dundovi, who wrote a piece um, called True Grit. And um, can you tell me a bit about what made her piece so special? Yeah, so this one was just for me, you know, just an outstanding piece of science writing. Um, she, you could tell that she had done so much research, like mind boggling amounts of research. At one point she referenced um, the, the, like the manifests of the Apollo missions. And, you know, <laughs> when I spoke to her about this because she won the Bragg Prize, I said, so did you actually go back and like find those manifests? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> like, oh my God. So this is a piece. For, for people who aren't familiar with the piece, this is a, um, a story. True Grit is referring both to moon dust, which is the um, uh, which is the topic of of the article superficially, but then it's this fabulous story also of the scientists behind it, and one of the scientists in particular who also showed absolute true grit was an Australian man. Um, Brian O'Brien, um, who sadly passed away last year, and he had this early research that um, Carol Dundovi sort of, um, yeah, brought brought to life in an incredible way. And it was, um, yeah, it was a marvelous story of human endeavor, and then this intriguing, intriguing um, science behind moon dust and all the all the um, problems that it can create for 
instruments on the moon and uh, people visiting the moon. It was uh, fabulous, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And yeah, the, the fact that, you know, when, when we were talking about the actual moon dust, she talked about, you know, the electrostatic properties of it mm. and the shape of the granules and things like that and mm. how those things. So she actually went deep into the science there of how these little grits were so pervasive and so much of a problem for the early astronauts and in fact continuing astronauts and she flagged that in the story that if there was one thing that was going to stop people going back to the moon it's the dust is because they just don't know how to deal with it and it gets into everything and it destroys the instruments and it would be a, a serious problem for any um, long-term visitation to the moon by humans um but yeah then she she used the the vehicle of of this scientist brian brian o'brien and, you know, he, he did all this research in it when he was a young buck and he was, you know, out there working for NASA and he was cool and, you know, hanging with all the cool kids. And, um, and then he sort of wandered off into a different direction in his career um, because the, the moon dust uh, research sort of went nowhere. And then he had this late revival of his interest in his work and, and just the sort of the way that, that she wrapped up the story um, was this 80 something year old man attending these conferences where he was being given this sort of rock star welcome <laughs> but you know that he was uh, you know worried about the long haul flights and how he was going to get his compression stockings on and off because he was having trouble bending over now that he's a bit <laughs> aged but you know just to add in these beautiful human elements it was um so poignant and so affecting and then of course you know when we published this in the anthology we had to add in the the postscript that mm -hmm. Brian O'Brien had passed away and it was just ah, oh, just and, and the way when it ended it was you know that he'd um he he was saying that he, oh you know if this interest in his research he was starting to feel young again and mm -hmm. then you know for it to be postscripted with that he, he passed away recently and oh, it was just the most beautiful you know piece of writing and you just mm. really felt for him and the lost opportunities that he'd had but then the excitement of the research rediscovered and and then of course in the middle there was this rollicking tale of rediscovery where these you know moon landing tapes were under a stairwell at the university of something <laughs> in western australia and, you know, it was yeah just an astonishing yeah. series of events yeah, it, it was one of those um, pieces that really, it really warms the cockles of your heart, really, <laughs> you know, yeah. and you think, oh, it's so, you know, the, the process of discovery can be so, so joyous and, and wonderful. But, but of course, there are, um, that's not the only thing that science writing should be doing, right? I mean, it can do more than just delight us and entertain us. Um, you come from a journalistic background. You must uh, believe in in uh, science writing have a having a, a greater um, purpose as well. Where do you see science writing as fitting in? Yeah, I, I think what you're asking me there is is whether um, science uh, science writers should be cheerleaders for science, or uh, whether we should you know be a bit more critical. And, you know, I think that that's a really important question for science journalists, not science writers per se. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we discussed, we had some, some of the entries this year were from working scientists who were talking about their research in plain English. Um, but science journalists, you know, if you think about political journalists, you don't expect political journalists to be, you know, cheering for politicians. Or, or politics in general, you expect them to be asking the hard questions and holding the politicians to account. Whereas uh, I think there's a kind of a belief with science journalists that they almost are, are there to promote science in some way to the general public and enthuse the general public about science. And I think that that has been particularly uh, borne out as problematic in the year of COVID where, you know, as you would well know, Diani, <laughs> um, reporting on, you know, the, the production of the vaccine, for example, has been um, made more difficult by the fact that people are nervous of the re reportage that we're getting about the vaccine. You know, how do we know it's safe? Well, because the science journalists told us this, it's safe. Yeah, but the science journalists want us to believe it's safe because they love science, you know. And so we then get into a situation 
where people are distrustful of the news because it's been served to them in one way for so long that when it's served to them in a different way, they don't, they're a bit more skeptical of it. And yeah, I think that, it, you know, if, if it was up to me, I would be interested in seeing science journalists pursuing a more critical line of science, um, asking the harder questions more often. But, you know, the thing with science journalism particularly is that it's mostly explaining, like it's mostly taking a paper that's been published by a scientist and explaining what the heck just happened to everybody in plain English, because, you know, you, you read a journal article, it's impenetrable unless you're in that field. And so that's usually the role of science journalists is almost as science explainers. Yeah, yeah. And, and do you think that, uh, I mean, this last 18 months has, you know, there's obviously been a phenomenal appetite for, um, for that explanatory um, writing and reporting, but also for, you know, analytical reporting, sort of, as you say, holding, um, holding people to account and really asking those questions about, um, about how, how science is being um, applied to, to our lives and, um, and that sort of thing. Do you think that science has gained a prominence or um, that, that maybe it didn't have previously, that maybe it's being seen that, you know, the, that readers do have an appetite or, or do you think this isn't necessarily going, we're not always going to have uh, science stories on the front page? Uh, I think we won't always have science stories on the front page. Oh, and I'm also going to say we, we always will have science stories on the front page because uh, in my opinion, science is a little bit like plumbing. Um, you don't notice it until it goes horribly wrong. Um, and for the most part, you know, everyone's very happy to, you know, press buttons on their smartphone and, you know, magically talk to someone on the other side of the world or upload the latest thing to Snapchat but no one really thinks about how that all came to be. Well, of course it came to be through science. Um, and so, you know, science manifests itself in, in the newspaper through, oh, well, you know, fill in the blank telephone company is just really the latest model of its phone. And that's not considered to be a science story because we're not getting into the, the whys and wherefores of, behind the technology, but it is still a scientific advance that's just happened but it's not necessarily seen as that. Mostly when people start to notice science is when something's going wrong, <laughs> like, you know, a pandemic sweeping the world um, or climate change or something like that. And they want, they turn to scientists to, to solve those problems for us. And if the scientists don't immediately have an answer for it, then, you know, well, what do we pay you all the money for? Um, whereas when scientists do develop, you know, the other, the other flip side of that, I guess, science writing is that when scientists miraculously come up with a solution for something, you know, like, um, you know, making disabled people walk again or something like that, that's always one of those, we have almost there kind of stories. And those ones are like, well, isn't it great? Look, look what science has done for us, you know? So I think it's, yeah, science is often just invisibly there in our everyday lives, and sometimes it takes a science journalist to point it out. Yes, that's right. And um, and as you say, I think uh, in your anthology and my anthology as well this year, um, you know, I think it can be said that we've got a healthy collection of of science writers and and writers in general who are, are tackling the these um, these big questions. I think um, there are plenty of of writers, well, Keridwen Dovey, for example, uh, she's also a fiction writer and she turns her hand to science writing as well. So um, it's, it's um, I think, like you say, because science is so enmeshed in our lives, it's almost hard to avoid, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Like it's this sort of, you know, invisible, invisible strings pulling the marionette really, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And do you think, uh, I mean, uh, you mentioned that uh, some of the people in uh, the some of the contributors in your anthology are working scientists, and the same is is true of my uh, of this year's anthology. Um, is there greater pressure now? Do you think on on scientists to be, you know, great um, communicators? I don't I don't necessarily like that word, but communicators about their 
uh, the work that they they do. Everyone's got a, themselves on social media and everything. I mean, has this really lifted the bar for science writing, do you think? I, I do. I think that scientists um, these days, there's a lot of pressure on them uh, and it's not exclusive to science, I should add, but there's a lot of pressure on people to be their own brand and have their own social media presence or have a blog or, you know, be a media, um, you know, spokesperson, that sort of thing. And you see it in uh, the, the people who do often get elevated to professorial chairs and things like that is, is they are ones who are a little more willing to poke their head up above the parapet mm -hmm. and make make a comment in the media on, on things. And, you know, I think that's, um, in some ways that's hard. That's asking a lot of our scientists mm -hmm. that they be experts in a particular field and also, you know, media spokespeople who are articulate and, and pithy in front of the camera. Um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, why couldn't we just let the scientists be in their lab and be good at their thing and and not have to be immediate tasks as well and look to be fair you know there are plenty of people who are like that but I think that it's often the case that people are expected to perform a lot but you know as I said that's not exclusive just to science I think you know that's true of of lots of industries these days and that you know the the uh the ones who are comfortable with self-promotion get promoted and it's interesting, isn't it? I, I, I think the tide may have changed, uh, may have turned with that, because I remember ages ago hearing about uh, David Suzuki, who obviously has written many books um, and working scientist in, um, at the University of British Columbia um, for a long time. And apparently he was really, it was, it was an uncomfortable thing with his colleagues that he was so out there in the media. So I think probably within academia, people are, are viewing, uh, you know, co conveying their research and um, telling people about its import to their lives is, uh, is really seen much more as part of a scientist's, uh, as a scientist's job now rather than a distraction from their work. Yeah, and, you know, you see that some people are actually given chairs where that is part of their role, is just mm -hmm. explaining this kind of thing to a, a captive audience, you know, and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, like mm -hmm. you and I both work in the field of science communication effectively and we are both paid, it's both our job. We, there is a professional industry of people who explain science and yeah. that that that... that uh, industry has arisen is I think indicative of a need and a hunger in society for that information and an acknowledgement that scientists are not always the best placed person to do it in many cases they are there's some brilliant communicators out there but not everyone is and yeah. you know I mean that's just that, that simple thing is some people are good with a sentence and some people just aren't you know and and that's no reflection on their other otherwise on their abilities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd love to get some uh, some questions from the audience. I'd love to hear from people, especially if you've got any curly questions for Sarah and I, because uh, we're in furious agreement here on on everything. So um, yeah, throw throw us a, throw us a, a curly one. We'd love to um, we'd love to tackle it. Um, so uh, let me just have a quick look. Okay, so some of, some of the things that that scientists tackle in their in their daily life it, um, they're trying to solve problems like this you know really intractable problem of climate change um, these are these are things that writers can I guess um, work through in much the same way like writing can be a process of of working through and considering options and um, and coming to some some kind of conclusion do you think there's I mean it's always seemed to me that science and and, and writing are, are really you know compatible in that way just um you know working through a problem taking people on that journey um do you think that um what am I trying to say do you think that more people um you know more scientists should perhaps you know 
sit down and work through their work through their problems on the page as well as you know just in the lab I think maybe um, I should turn that question back on you Diane <laughs> and ask why did you leave the lab and go into science writing oh you know uh boy Lots of <laughs> lots of reasons. Give me the positive you know parts what? of think, the question. <laughs> okay, I'm going to answer it by saying um, there were many there were many things that you know perhaps pushed me away from the lab. But what really drew me to science writing and science journalism, um, and has kept me here. And I can't imagine you know pursuing another career any you know outside of science writing is because uh, it is this endless uh, um, ability to explore different topics to um, find out you know I mean there's just so much um, learning potential and uh, you you just meet some fabulous people and I, it's just so um, so full and rich <laughs> not just in what you're you're reading about but also I think you know the there's endless possibilities in how you then tell that story um, of science and it can be a short newsy piece if that's what you're writing it can be an in-depth investigation it can be you know speaking to dozens of of scientists and trying to nut out for the reader what the consensus is, where the points of friction are in um, in a field, and it can also, you know, just be um, your own um, your own exploration of of a topic. So yeah, that, that's why <laughs> that's why I'm here, I guess. Um, and, and and so if you if you have this complete open slather, you know, you've got all the yeah. world of science in front of you and all of the, the published research, which is, you know, vast quantities of material every week, every day. How do you, as a science writer, even start to try and pick apart what's going to make a good story, what, what to throw away and what to continue with? Uh, well, the starting point is often serendipity. You might see a little short news report that kind of makes you think, oh, that's that's kind of curious or maybe you're talking to a scientist for one piece and you and they might say something and you go oh okay that's that's the kernel of an idea for for another uh, another piece but for me I guess what makes a really interesting story is um something where I mean I you know I, I love conflict or unresolved um questions because I think that's really that's what, what science is. It's like dealing with these um, these big questions and how to solve them. And there's never usually, you know, one sort of, you know, unimpeachable truth that science deals with. It's, um, I, I remember a few years ago, there was a, a, a science, the science party or the political party. And I thought, but, but what, is, what does that mean? Because there's never one version of what, an answer, a scientific, a scientifically supported evidence-based answer is. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for, for where, where those um, points of tension are between scientists, between scientists and society or culture or anything like that. Those are, those are I think, um, the stories that really draw me in. But um, yeah, and, I'm going to go to a question that we've got from Q and A, and I, I can't say who who sent this um, this question in. And this is kind of the flip side of what we've been talking about, Sarah. What, what do you hate seeing in science writing? Um, that one's quite easy. I hate. <laughs> Maybe I just hate these things about writing in general. Okay, there's lots of things. Shall I shall I list them all? <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I really hate is the rhetorical question as a narrative device to keep the story moving, you know, um, how could this be? And then next paragraph answered the question. <laughs> I'm like, oh, for God's sake, can we be a bit more sophisticated? We don't need the rhetorical question. Um, the Let other me write thing some I'm, notes here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Next file story with you. Yeah. I will take it out. I'm an editor. I'll take it out. <laughs> um, the, yeah, the other thing I really hate is the word breakthrough. 
um, mm-hmm. because science is a series of ongoing incremental developments. Uh, yes, there's sometimes there are some big ones, but mm-hmm. the big ones are very far and few between, and I think it just gets overused as a term. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I just hate the word breakthrough in most things, and we'll take it out. Um, they're, they're the ones that leapt into my mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I think, um, I think uh, yeah, it, it's a bit of a cliche, and it, it, given how much of a bad rap breakthrough or game changer, um, you know, those terms, they really have quite a bad rap, but they still, they, 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 they still come out all the time. And, you know, I used to think, um, you know, in some cases, cliches, Cliches are actually okay um, in in some writing because they are that mental shorthand that readers can use to to sort of understand something very quickly. Um, Even better, though, is if you take a cliche and you make it your own, you, you know, massage it into something that's a a little bit, um, a little bit different. Um, Yeah. I once had a friend who described something very easy as a walk in the cake. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I agree with you. And and I think that cliches are, um, you know, the bane of good writing, but mm. it's very easy to fix that. You know, you take your cliche and you subvert it, problem solved. But mm. the problem is when people, it, it, it's not the cliches like, you know, it's raining cats and dogs kind of cliche that are the ones that are the most egregious. It's the ones that are just so a part of daily language that you don't even realize that they're a cliche until you're really thinking about language Mm -hmm. and uh, where would be an example of that you know just saying that um it was a um a recent development which i hate because it's tautology but you know Mm -hmm. that people just say that all the time and Mm -hmm you know it's and it just, means nothing to a reader it, because what's recent it's all relative <laughs> yeah exactly it's it's a useless turn of phrase and it's it's lazy it's lazy writing it's yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so we have another question here from from lee are you hungry for your writing to be celebrated or is it enough just to have written something that you yourself think is good well i'm an editor <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't write all that much, to be honest. I, I, I have a, an ongoing theory that um, editors are thwarted writers and that we just want to be writers when we grow up. A um, <laughs> <Ed> John, <and>, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, but, you know, look, as, as a praise pig, I, I will take someone celebrating my writing. I think that's always a nice thing. Um, but probably more than anything, you know, as a, a writey sort of person, it's just about writing. Like I don't, I, you're probably the same, Diani, but you can't not write, right? Writers are people who have to write. And so they do it, even if you didn't get published, you'd probably keep a journal because that's the sort of people we are. How about you? Yeah, look, I think, um, uh, I think a byline, having my name to a piece is, um, it does, it does make me feel good. I guess. It does, yeah. It's um, nice to see your name up in lights. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of, I mean, uh, so we both work for, for nature. Um, I do a lot of writing for nature as a freelancer. And, um, you know, I, I guess I've often thought about, you know, if I really wanted, you know, that name recognition, should I be, you know, going for different publications? But I think often, you know, you, you know, when I get a response from someone I've interviewed and I send them the link to the article and they say, this is, you know, this is uh, the best summary of this area of research that that I've read, you know, that brings me a lot of joy to sort of have my, my work respected from the people whose work I'm describing, um, you know, as well as hopefully readers of the work but um yeah personal praise yeah like like Sarah I'll 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 take it (laughs) absolutely but um but yeah I think um it it is really good getting to the end of a piece and I imagine even as an editor Sarah you you must feel the same that when you when you put up a a really good piece because my pieces 
by the time they they get published, you know, I really feel like it's um it's very much um it can be a very collaborative process with um, with your editor. So uh, you know, getting to the end of that and and knowing that it's good um, is 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 really rewarding. Yeah, that was something that I noticed about some of the entries that came in, particularly from younger, less established writers, was that I'd read them and think, you know, like, for example, Keridan Dovey's piece, she was published in Wired, and Wired will have some of the best editors in the world, probably three of them, and she's probably gone back and forth with those editors several times where they've said, oh, you just need a bit more of information about this in this section, and so they've helped her develop that piece into the you know the pearl that it is and I was when reading through the entries to the anthology there was some people who were younger writers less published and so they weren't didn't have the benefit of a really good editor going through their writing and mm. supporting them to make good decisions and you know I could see that they had real promise but they just didn't have the benefit of an editor and I thought well you know it's not fair really that you're up against somebody who's in Wired you know this multi-award winning journalist and you're a young person who I can spot the potential but you just you know you're not as good as as she is objectively um, and you know then I was sort of tangled up in decisions of whether to put that person in anyway or put those people in anyway because they clearly have potential or whether to just actually call this an anthology of the people who are the best yeah 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 it's tough isn't it because like you say there's um there's varying levels of support when you're a writer and uh, depending on which outlet you write for sometimes uh, sometimes I find that you know there are people who you know, really have these great qualities in their writing. But I know that it's uh, limited by the style that they are of, of the publication they're writing for. And, you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, you, you can't sort of break out and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. lace your writing with metaphors if that's really not not the style that, that the publication is going for. So, um, yeah, it, it, it can be tough. Uh, someone's asked, um, about Ed, Ed Yong, we've um, mentioned him a couple of times and they're wanting to know what, what, what do you think makes Ed Yong or writers like Yong at the Atlantic or the New York, New York Times, for instance, uh, so good? Oh, well, because he's magic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do you I know think... what I think? Yeah, go on, tell us. Sorry, uh, just to, just to, just to, <laughs> to butt in. I, um, you know, Ed Yong had this background where he was working for the Wellcome Trust oh, I think, um, in the UK and he was working as a, um, a press officer. Um, but then on the side, he, would, he wrote this blog, not exactly rocket science. And I think that conversational tone that he had in, um, in that blog, he's been able to bring that across into his more journalistic work. I think that's one thing that um, that Ed Yong really does well is he writes in such a way that you feel like he's just talking to you. And then on top of all of that, he's got an immense ability to, you know, um, zoom out and see this these broad picture um, sort of trends and, you know, he's, yeah, yeah. Is there anything else that sort of appeals for, for you, Sarah? Yeah, yeah, I, I think he um, he is the master of just the really good explain. Like, mm. you know, as I was saying earlier, that so much of science writing is actually just explaining science to the general mm -hmm. public. And he nails it. Like, he just comes up with these pissy little metaphors or something where you just go, oh, yeah, I get it now. <laughs> and, like... I don't know how he does that he does it so consistently yeah. and then yeah the other thing is just uh, he just is on top of whatever the story of the day is and he seems to have spent six months researching it to produce a story within like five minutes of this being a, a breaking story mm -hmm. and the only way that I think he must be able to do that is that he is actually just really uh, forward looking to see what is going to be the, the moving story of the time. And he's researching it from way back. And um, yeah, all of his pieces are really well considered. You know, he puts in 
balance, uh, that's something we haven't talked about this evening is, you know, mm -hmm. achieving balance in your sources. You know, he makes an effort to find female and male sources, black mm -hmm. and white sources, sources not just from North America, but from around the world. And, you know, for him to achieve all of this in such a short space of time, is just mind boggling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is why he won the Pulitzer. Um, oh, did he? I didn't I think know that. Yeah, he, he did, uh, which I think, uh, yeah, what can you say? Extraordinarily well-deserved, I, I think. Um, he was on book leave when the pandemic ramped up. So he was writing his second book and he got drawn back in and, um, yeah, has produced some of the the all-time great pieces yep. um, explaining the pandemic, explaining the the science, but also the the societal context, the political context that goes goes with it. It's um, yeah, masterful writing, like you say. So. Yeah, yeah, and you know, as we said, he's supported by being working for a great mm. publication who consistently does excellent journalism. Who's you know, no doubt lifting him from his blog writing earlier career <laughs> to being the the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist that he is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I guess um, we, we're just a minute away from 8.30. So I, I think oh, I don't see any more questions, burning questions popping up in the Q&A box. Um, so I guess this is probably a good, a good spot to leave it tonight. Um, Sarah, it's been a, um, a delight having a, having a chat with you tonight. And uh, the Best Australian Science Writing 2020, edited by Sarah Phillips, is available to borrow from Geelong Regional Libraries. And of course, it's also available to buy from uh, their bookshop partner, uh, Cook and Young Booksellers in Geelong. And uh, we will put a link up uh, in the chat section um, shortly. And um, and this year's anthology, edited by me, will be available later in the year. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, so the um, that link has just been put up in the chat box. So Diani, when will when will the twenty twenty one edition be available for purchase? So that's coming out in November, um, just in time for Christmas stocking fillers um, and uh, presents for loved ones, family, friends, anyone really. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, on, on behalf of uh, Geelong Regional Libraries, I'd like to thank everyone who's uh, come along and joined us tonight. Thank you for the questions uh, from the audience and, um, and thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thanks for having us, Geelong. Thank you very much.